Hi, welcome back. So today my guest is Scott Falsgren, who is a health coach, blogger, podcaster, health writer, and advocate. He is the editor and founder of betterhealthguy.com, where he shares his 23-year journey through the world of Lyme disease, mold, and the myriad of factors that chronic, chronic health also often entails. His podcast, Better Health Guy, Blogcast, interviews many of the leaders in the field and is available on his website, betterhealthguy.com, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, all the usual places. He has been interviewed on numerous podcasts and has lectured on his recovery from chronic illness at conferences and on several, several online summits. And he's written for the Townsend and other publication. He is the founder of the Forum of Integrative Medicine, which hosts an annual conference bringing together some of the top integrative practitioners to share tools for treating complex chronic illness. He serves on the board of directors at the Limelight Foundation, which provides treatment grants to children and young adults recovering from Lyme disease. Today, Scott is grateful for his current state of health and all that he has learned in his life-changing journey. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Scott shares his story in a bit more detail. And then we talk about the 11-step process that he's created to restore optimal health after struggling with Lyme and mold. So subjects close to my heart for sure. And I know there's a few of you listening to this podcast who also struggle with some of these things. So if you're struggling with like brain fog or fatigue, this episode's pretty full on. So it's one that you're going to want to refer back to and listen to multiple times. And I know that a lot of you aren't struggling with these things currently, which is great. And you're still educating yourselves. And I hope that you never have to deal with mold or Lyme. But if you find yourself in this situation down the line or loved ones do, you're going to feel more educated and knowledgeable about these subjects and hopeful that there are outcomes and there are success stories like Scott's. So yeah, we cover a lot of different things like mitochondrial function and sleep and circadian rhythm and cell danger response, a ton of different complex subjects. And Scott was so um, so kind to share his, his thoughts and his time with us today. And his podcast is one of my favorite ones. And he, he shares a lot about all of these different complex chronic illnesses. And it's really helped me in my health journey as well. So let's get into the episode. Hi, Scott. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today. Thank you so much for inviting me. So could you start off before we get into this complex subject of mold and Lyme disease? Tell us first a bit about your personal experience and health journey. Yeah, so my story started in 1997, so it's been a while now, and I was in Northern California. I, um, over the course of a weekend, started off with what felt like a very significant flu, but it wasn't a normal flu. I had these weird burning sensations throughout my entire body, um, so at the time, it felt like a flu times 100. Um, the burning sensations were probably the most significant symptoms. It was kind of a, a neurological pain that felt a lot like having a sun burn um, all the time around the clock. I had trouble just getting up and walking across the room. I had a lot of balance issues. So sitting in a chair, I always felt like I was leaning to the side and was going to fall off. Even lying flat in bed, I had to prop up pillows along one side to try and um, feel like I wasn't going to roll onto the floor. Um, I, at the time, didn't know anything about Lyme disease, and it took eight years and 45 doctors to finally get a diagnosis. But, you know, the list of symptoms of Lyme and mold, we'll get into that as well, and that was a piece of my journey also. Um, you know, there, there's hundreds of symptoms of these, and so I had the difficulty walking and the balance issues, but I also had blurred vision. I had floaters and lines and squiggles in my visual field. I had a low-grade fever that lasted for over a year. Um, joint pain, lots of gastrointestinal issues, nausea, um, lots of cognitive issues as well. So brain fog, memory loss, um, muscle spasms, numbness and tingling. I had this strange motor-like tapping sensation in my left foot that felt like there was a car engine kind of running there all the time. I could feel this tapping, um, very fatigued. I had tremors muscle pain, muscle twitching or fasciculations, neck and back pain, um, air hunger, 
this weird kind of crawling sensation of something kind of crawling under the skin. And then I was light sensitive and sound sensitive. And of course, all of this heightens anxiety and depression and OCD and all of those kinds of things. And so from 1997 to 2005, I had seen 45 doctors. Most of them suggested that it was all psychological. Um, I did get a diagnosis at the time of chronic fatigue syndrome and a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. I had one practitioner that suggested exploring uh, multiple sclerosis with a neurologist. Um, and this was, you know, 23 years ago. And so we didn't really have Google. The only thing I could find about chronic fatigue syndrome online was that some people seem to recover after a decade. Um, that didn't seem very hopeful to me. And so that was not my personality to wait and see. Uh, in 2005, fortunately, I had kind of started over with a new medical doctor and he sent me to a lady that did electroacupuncture or EAV. Um, some people may know it as electrodermal screening and she worked at an outlet mall next to a coffee shop. And I thought this is all very strange. But he said to have her explore the foods that I might be reactive to, avoid those in my diet. And the only thing that could be wrong with me that he could figure out at the time was that I was uh, intolerant to the foods that I was eating. And so after about two hours with her, she said, I think you need to go back to your doctor and be tested for Lyme or Borrelia um, and many of the co-infections, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia. And so I didn't really take it all that seriously at that point. A couple weeks later, I ran into her again and she said, you know, this is a serious issue. You need to take it seriously and get tested. Ultimately, we were able to confirm all of the things that she identified with traditional blood tests. And so so that kind of piqued my interest in energetic testing and energy medicine. I was at the time working in the computer software development industry, very logical, um, needed to understand things. And so it was kind of hard for me at that point to understand the energetic testing. But that led me to Dr. Dietrich Klinghart's work, which um, he's now been my primary mentor for many, many years and um, really value the framework, um, the paradigm for healing that he's put together. And so today, fortunately, with the Lyme and mold journey, I'm doing very well. I do still take very good care of myself, but um, I feel tremendously blessed and grateful to be doing as well as I am and to have the level of health that I do today. That is amazing. And your story is so inspiring. And you kindly, you mentioned before we started recording that you had a training session with Dr. Klinghart Plan, but you kindly spent your time with the audience of the Hormones and Harmony podcast instead. So I really appreciate that because he is an amazing practitioner and wealth of knowledge. So um, I think it's great that we learn from all of these different people and then spread the message like you're doing so well with your podcast and just the work that you do. But I want to ask since 15 years ago when you were diagnosed with Lyme and then after that mold um, you found out that that was a problem if you were to do all of it again where would you have started and were there any mistakes that you made that you wish you hadn't yeah, it's definitely been a learning process. And so I, I first want to say that my understanding today is really the result of so many mentors. So Dr. Klinghart, we've talked about, Dr. Neil Nathan, Dr. Simon Yu, uh, Dr. Raj Patel, so many people. I've been so blessed. Sometimes I just feel, you know, that the universe has really um, guided me and connected me with people that I so honor and am really so grateful for their role in my own personal journey, but also just and helping me to understand all of this. And so I, I kind of in my brain has emerged a, a model of how I might approach this now. And it's constantly changing or learning new th things. So it's not necessarily going to always be exactly the same. But I think the, the, the overall framework is, um, it is very comprehensive. And so it's not a protocol in that it's something that people should go off and follow exactly. But I think it is a good framework for discussion with their practitioners in terms of what might make sense for each individual person. And so just at a very high level, there's essentially 11 steps that I think about. The first one is supporting detoxification and drainage with the goal of improving our terrain. The second step is improving the external environment. So that's primarily mold and electromagnetic fields. It's so critical to make sure that the external environment is supporting our health optimization. 
the third step is optimizing sleep. Um, so critical for every aspect of healing. Step four is working on the mental and emotional side of things, looking at our past traumas, conflicts, belief systems. Um, I, I think that plays a big role in many of these types of chronic conditions. Step five is retraining the limbic system and really tonifying or strengthening the parasympathetic nervous system. So if we're in that constant sympathetic dominance, dominance, um, fight, flight, or freeze kind of response, it's really difficult to be able to heal. A big aspect of healing is working on the nervous system. Step six is stabilizing mast cells, looking at how to reduce inflammation, how to modulate the immune system. Um, we'll get into that, but I think a lot of the symptoms that people experience are the result of uh, an immune system that's hyperactive. Uh, not so much the bug itself, but it's our response, the host response response to the microbe that creates a lot of the inflammation, a lot of the symptoms that we experience. Step seven is optimizing nutrition, uh, looking at the microbiome, how to support the gut, the digestive system, so important. Step eight is, it's a group of kind of foundational things. I could break these out further, but um, <clears throat> looking at things like the mitochondria, looking at things like how well are we getting hydrated? Um, do we need to support the body with zinc and vitamin B and so on because maybe there's cryptopyroluria in the background? Do we need to look at things like hypercoagulation? Maybe the blood's too thick and we need to optimize that. Do we need to support the adrenals? So this is kind of more foundational supportive things. It may not apply to everyone, but I think it is something that, that we need to explore and see if it is something to explore further in a given individual. Step nine then, which is, is very close to the end, which is surprising to some people. That's why I really think then addressing the microbial overgrowth. So looking at the viruses, looking at the retroviral activation, looking at parasites and SIBO and other um, microbiome imbalances, looking at fungus and yeast and things like candida, um, even the potential for colonization from water damaged building exposure, I think is something we need to explore as well. Looking at Lyme and co-infections. And then once we've worked through the majority of kind of this microbial burden and getting it down, then some people need to also look at potentially doing things to reduce biofilm that can be protecting these microbes as well. So I see that um, kind of towards the end, it's usually not something you want to do too early as it can, you know, release more microbes and more toxins into the system and really trigger some inflammation. Um, step 10 is looking at the dental contributors. Again, these, the order may change if someone really has a very significant issue that um, might be more impacting of their overall health. That's from a dental perspective, they might need to do something sooner. But I think getting kind of the framework in place first, and then seeing are there dental issues that need to be explored. And then finally, step 11, after we've gotten through Lyme disease and mold illness and detoxification and all of these things, you know, it, it's a long process. And so is there some uh, regeneration, some restoration that needs to occur? How do we support the body, you know, after we've gotten through this condition? So if there's some, some damage maybe that's happened, how do we really support the body in repairing that? So we're going to be going through each step and just expanding on those things a little bit more. But I know it's completely different for everyone, but for on average, like how long do you see people taking to get through all of these steps? Are we doing like one at a time, making sure that it's fully optimized before we move to the next? Or can they be kind of something that you do concurrently? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they many of them can be done concurrently. So it's not that they have to be done one at a time. And again, it's not that they have to be done for a given person in this exact order. I mean, everyone's individual it needs to be personalized. Um, you know, the, the duration is really going to depend. So it depends in part on how long someone's been ill. Um, and I think that it really depends on the external environment the most. So, you know, if someone 
is in a very mold poor environment, meaning that we probably aren't ever going to have a mold free environment. But if we have a mold poor environment, um, we maybe can work through, you know, a significant part of our health restoration in, you know, 18 months potentially. But I think that if mold is an ongoing factor, that it, it it's really difficult to even say whether or not someone will make significant progress. The mold piece really probably is the most critical piece to rule out and or address in order to optimize recovery. So we can take all kinds of supplements and do all kinds of other things, but if we still have mold exposure, um, I, I think the, the clock, so to speak, doesn't really start until the environment around us has been optimized. I totally agree with that. And I can, I can say firsthand that that is the case for me at least, because for the past seven years, I've been working on my health, I've been doing round after round of gut restoration protocols, doing the coffee enemas, doing the meditation, and I had improved. So my symptoms were manageable and I felt okay. Um, but I, in order to be okay, I would need to spend hundreds of pounds every month on these supplements. I'd need to be super strict with my diet, low histamine, not stray away from that at all. And then I started to realize, okay, this isn't normal. I'm just kind of managing symptoms and I'm still not dealing with the root cause so it wasn't until the end of last year that I started hearing about mold all over the place like popping up in webinars and podcasts and I was like what is this mold situation and then I think I knew intuitively that it was a factor for me I think you just know sometimes when you hear about things multiple times I did the test my mycotoxin urine panel lit up like a Christmas tree and I said to you again before we started recording that I've been in my new home. I was planning on moving anyway, but it just came at the perfect time that I could then move. And three, two, three weeks in, my brain fog had completely gone. But there's obviously a lot of work to do um, in terms of mast cell activation syndrome type symptoms. I know that's going to take a while, but that's a really positive sign that I'm on the right track. And I was very careful not to like cross contaminate and that can make you very anxious um, so I'm going to be doing my own podcast on um, tips and tricks that I've learned from practitioners on like cleaning clothes and all, all of that because it is so important not to move all of your stuff into a brand new home and kind of recontaminate the issue. But um, beautiful, yeah, beautiful. the mold piece is absolutely key and I'm trying to spread this message a lot more because even though in the functional or holistic world, it's becoming more recognized in the medical conventional medical treatment it's just not a thing and I don't think it will be for at least 30 to 50 years because when they think of mold they think of allergies or severely immunocompromised people not just the average person person with hormone imbalances and, and food intolerances um, they don't think that that's ever going to be a problem absolutely so let's start with step one in more detail detoxification and drainage so the term detoxification is a bit of a trendy word at the moment. I think my audience are aware that the type of detoxification I'm talking about isn't the same, but um, could you talk about the difference between detox and drainage and why it's so critical? So in my experience, detoxification and drainage really are the most important aspect of any recovery protocol. I think we today live in a soup of toxins that we have never before experienced. Um, I don't believe that we would have problems with microbes like Borrelia and co-infections like Bartonella and Babesia and so on if we didn't have such a toxic terrain. So from my perspective, improving the terrain is the road back. If we look at things like candida, like parasites, um, those can be present in the body in part to actually protect us from heavy metals. So they can concentrate heavy metals, which is protective, but at the same time, um, you know, we may not want them there long term. So detoxification really is an indirect antimicrobial strategy. If we get rid of the toxins, we don't then need these microbes to come in like, again, candida and parasites in order to protect us from heavy metals, for example. So the first step, I think, really is reducing incoming toxicity as much as possible. 
If we look at things like personal care products, like scented products, laundry detergents, um, looking at the ways that we can best get pure air, pure food, and pure water, um, we need to think about the potentials of all of those toxins that we're introducing into the body as well from other things like um, breast implants or metal implants potentially in the body as well. So for me, uh, detoxification is really primarily about binders. Once we get toxins that are processed by the liver, that are in the bile, that move into the gallbladder and into the small intestine, through the intestines and out of the body, we really want to minimize the reabsorption or enterohepatic recirculation of those toxins. So a lot of the bile gets reabsorbed by the body, but if we have these binders to latch onto the toxins, then we increase the excretion of toxins and reduce or minimize the reabsorption of those toxins. So detoxification, primarily binders. And then drainage, I'm thinking about how do we support the body's innate ability to, um, to detoxify, to excrete toxins. So looking at the liver, the gallbladder, the kidneys, the extracellular matrix or interstitium, the colon, um, even the skin and the lungs. So we have to optimize all of these exit routes or what's also known as emunctories. Um, really important early on that people are pooping. If people are constipated, that does not go with a healing protocol. So that's an early priority. And then looking at the bile flow, looking at the gallbladder, how do we keep things moving? Because if we're not getting the toxins into the bile, into the gallbladder, into the intestine, we really then are not able to optimize the binders that we're taking. The binders need to be able to meet up with those toxins. And that really is very dependent on the bile flow, the liver, the gallbladder. And if we're not then able to um, really optimize the bile flow, then a lot of these toxins actually can get pushed back into the bloodstream, which can create a detoxification reaction or a Herxheimer-like reaction. So supporting uh, bile, supporting gallbladder, really critical for optimizing the binders. We can take binders all day and, and do very little if we're not also looking at how to optimize the bile flow. So in the binder realm, there's so many good tools. I, I love uh, Supreme Nutrition's talk Sumi Supreme. There's a company called Microbe Formulas that has um, Metchem, Foundation, Biotox, all fantastic products in my experience. Uh, BioPure is a company that has uh, Chlorella and Zeolite. And then you know, there's a lot of tools like bentonite clay, other zeolite products, chlorella, and so on that can be really helpful. And then in the drainage realm, I'm usually thinking about homeopathic tools. So homeopathic support for liver, kidneys, lymphatics, matrix, and so on. Um, many different companies, energetics, picana, desbio. And then sometimes also layering in herbal support that can be helpful in addition to the homeopathic. So maybe milk thistle or dandelion for the liver or soladago for the kidneys or red root for the lymphatic system, for example. So many companies um, that, that provide tools there, BioRay is one company that we have here in the US that has some fantastic tools like Liver Life and Liver Lover and so on. Um, BioPure has a great liver product that I in fact just took before our conversation today called Liver tincture that I really like as well for liver gallbladder support. And then also thinking about trace minerals. So trace minerals also very important in improving the terrain, but also minimizing the body's um, uh, need to hold on to heavy metals over time. So um, a blend of trace minerals, sometimes targeted minerals like silica, for example, can be really helpful um, in dealing with, let's say, aluminum. So a number of different things that can be done for metals, though I would say my initial thought process is to focus more broadly on detoxification and drainage and not focusing too much on aggressive metal interventions or metal chelation which I think in some cases can backfire early on. So um, starting broad and then lots of tools if we need to get more specific later with metals um, or even things like glyphosate, which is a pesticide that's very common as well. And so another aspect of detoxification and drainage is movement. Um, even just walking every day is enough. Rebounding um, for the lymphatic system on a mini trampoline can be fantastic as well. I think sometimes we forget that inexperienced 
inexpensive interventions can really cover a lot of ground. And then there's a number of other tools in the detox and drainage realm that I think are great. You've already mentioned coffee enemas. I, that's very, very high on my list for many reasons. Um, colon hydrotherapy, castor oil, uh, packs that you can put over the liver, the abdomen, for example, the ionic foot baths is something that I do regularly as well. Oil pulling can be helpful. Um, liver gallbladder flushes, though I think those should be medically supervised and, and done in uh, participation with a practitioner. Saunas can be great, but again, there's kind of a timing. I think early on saunas can be challenging for people. I think later they seem to work a little better, but you have to really think about if you're sweating things out, that's great. But if you're also mobilizing toxins inside the body when you're doing a sauna, is your liver, kidneys, uh, lymphatic system, colon, are all those elimination channels open and ready to deal with toxins that are then going to get mobilized? So I do like saunas, but I think that you have to think about is the timing right? And if it's um, uncomfortable for someone, um, then I think it's probably not the right thing at this time. So that's that's kind of the, the main detoxification and drainage um, thoughts. The majority of people listening to this podcast as well will already be eating a healthy diet, but do diet changes fall under this as well? And if so, like what is your general overview in terms of diet recommendations? Yeah, so let's come back. I, I actually, the diet piece I do have is one of the later steps and we can get into the details there. But I, um, again, you know, someone could move diet up earlier. I think that's totally fine. But I think we want to get a few other things generally in place first. For example, the mold, the EMFs, those kinds of things. Um, shifting the diet is generally always going to be a good thing to eliminate the items that are stressing someone. But to your point, um, you know, we can focus a lot on the gut. And if we're still getting mold exposure, okay. um, it's probably not going to have the, the full benefit. And so um, I do put the, the focus on nutrition, eliminating foods, working on the microbiome a little bit later in the conversation. Perfect. So yeah, let's dive into mold and EMFs. Because when I started researching mold and mycotoxins, the connection with EMS is crazy. So I think it was Dr. Klingart who did the study with the Petri dish, put it next to a Wi-Fi box, and it like exploded by up to 600 times in mycotoxins. Tell us a bit about why EMS are a problem and how we can reduce our exposure. Yeah, so that, that, that is something that Dr. Klinghart talks a lot about, and I think it also, from his perspective, is part of why we're seeing such an explosion of water-damaged building issues, because we are bombarded now with all of these EMFs from cell towers and things of that nature. So um, in his mind, the first thing that you do in someone who has a mold issue in their living environment is turn off your Wi-Fi. And so when we're looking at mold and EMFs, I think the first thing is, our internal environment will only ever be as good or as healthy as our external environment. So it's really why so many people today are sick. It's the external environment that's become so toxic. So we can take supplements all day long, but if that external environment in our home, in our school, in our workplace, um, if those are our kryptonite, then we will never again regain our superhero status. So it's so critical. First mold, um, I think is, um, one of the biggest players in the soup of stressors that we're exposed to. So water damaged buildings. Um, I think for many people with Lyme disease that mold is often more important than chasing the Lyme microbes and co-infections and things of that nature. There is generally in someone who has chronic Lyme disease, particularly if they're not responding to treatment, there's usually a significant mold exposure somewhere in their history. It doesn't have to be now. It can be the place they lived a year ago or three years ago or five years ago that's still impacting them. Um, there are not any perfect tests in this realm. So uh, Mycometrics or Envirobiomics has the ERMI, which is the Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. I think that's a good place to start. Um, and then you can actually convert that to what's called the Hertz Me Too score, which is something that was uh, put forward by Dr. Richie Shoemaker, which also gives us some insight about the environment. 
Some people like to do mold plate testing. So Immunolytics is a company that does plate testing. Um, I, I think that's an, uh, an adjunct tool. I do think that the Ermi and the Hertz Me Too are, are probably where you want to go first, but then the mold plate testing can also be another great tool, especially if you see mold growing on a plate, that gives you a sense of, okay, there's something here we need to explore. Now about half of what grows on the plate is not necessarily health negating. So then you need to send it in and have them tell you exactly what's on it. Um, if someone can afford to get an IEP or indoor environmental professional to come inspect, that's usually the best way to do it. So maybe you do some of the self-testing first, like the ERMI, the Hurts Me Too, the immunolytics plates, and then if you see something there or you really suspect mold is an issue, then you get an IEP to come out. You mentioned uh, urinary mycotoxin testing. So uh, Great Plains, the mycotox is a tool that I really like. Real-time labs is another that offers that. There's a couple other companies companies now that are offering mycotoxin testing. It's not perfect. I mean, you have to consider that we do get mycotoxin exposure from food, but depending on the levels, the pattern, and so on, um, correlated with how the person's feeling and the testing of their environment and so on, it can really help to nicely paint the picture. And then once we identify an exposure, we either then have to remediate it or find a new environment that better supports our health restoration. So it's not an easy process, uh, but it is one of the things that we do have to do. So ideally, this comes really early in, in the whole recovery process. If someone has Lyme and co-infections and they're, they're in a kill, kill, kill type type of protocol and they haven't looked at mold, I think they're really doing themselves a, um, a great disservice. And I personally probably could have shaved off a lot of time in my own recovery had I known that I was in a moldy place, had I been able to, to address that. Um, when I got diagnosed in 2005 was the same year that Richie Shoemaker's book Mold Warriors came out. And so I fairly quickly um, figured that piece out, but, but very important. Air filtration can be helpful, um, but it's not a solution by itself. I mean, the core exposure needs to be addressed. I think of mold in a, in a home or workplace or school kind of like a cancer that generally you want to remove the tumor before you start chemotherapy, for example. So um, I do think air filters are helpful. I have several of them in my home to optimize the air quality, but I wouldn't rely on them if I suspected that I had a mold issue. And then incorporating binders that we've already talked about. There are some tools that are a little more specific for um, uh, mold and mycotoxin. So Microbe Formulas has one called Biotox. Um, there's a company called Beyond Balance that has Toxies Bind and ProMyco. Takasumi Supreme, again, I think is very helpful here with uh, mycotoxins as well. Some people benefit from tools like cholestyramine and Wellcall and so on. I, I generally have observed that the natural options can be uh, very helpful and that cholestyramine or Wellcall may be needed if the person still has some ongoing exposure. So again, we really want to um, reduce the exposure, make sure that we're in what Dr. Klinghart calls a mold-poor environment. And then we can also look at the microbes themselves. So we might need to later consider um, antifungals, for example. Is it possible that in our sinuses, in our gut, we now have some colonization of aspergillus or other water-damaged building molds that could then lead to production of mycotoxins inside the body? Um, I think that that is something that does happen and something that in some people needs to be explored. It's not always the case. Some people do very well fixing the environment, um, taking binders and so on, but there are some people that need to explore that potential of colonization. So once the mold issue has been ruled out, I think we've really, we've taken a very significant roadblock to our recovery. We've removed that. Um, again, I cannot overstress how important this is. So don't miss looking at mold. Um, it can save you years of struggling if you're just focused on Lyme disease, for example. Then the EMF conversation comes into the picture. So that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue in our world. I think of EMFs as another toxin that can really drain our vitality, um, keep our cells in a sympathetic dominant state, which also then impairs our ability to detoxify. So turning off Wi-Fi, for example, tossing out cordless phones, um, sleeping in a Faraday cage, which I've done every night since 2006 when Dr. Klinghart first turned me on to that. Um, those can be very helpful, but then 
like looking at things like the electrical stress from the wiring in the walls, would a demand switch that turns off the power from the circuit breakers be helpful? Um, measuring our body voltage and our sleep location and then reducing that. So reducing EMF exposure also very critical. More important to, to really focus on this at nighttime while we're sleeping. We're going to get some exposure during the daytime, but really um, creating that sleep sanctuary. Um, personally, I got rid of my cordless phones. I, I rarely use a cell phone to um, actually do calls. I tend to text more. Um, I will never hold the cell phone to my head. I do have a protective case on it. My Wi-Fi is automatically scheduled to turn off during the day and turn off while I'm sleeping. Um, I have Stetzer filters in the spaces that I spend lots of time. I also have one of the demand switches um, that can help with essentially kind of turning off the circuit breakers while you're sleeping. Sometimes I use a grounding pad as well, which can help in, in the EMF realm. Um, and again, Dr. Klinghart really suggests that there is this connection between the EMFs and the molds, that shutting off the Wi-Fi is an important part of addressing mold in a living environment. So um, this is another area where you can do a lot of self-testing. Um, there's various meters out there. I still, in my own experience, found it helpful even after the self-testing to hire a building biologist that could come in and say, you know, you've done really great in, in mitigating a lot of these, but did you realize that your printer is still connecting wirelessly over the internet constantly to try to download something and, you know, things of that nature. And they can give you steps then for how to mitigate that EMF exposure. So um, there is, a connection between EMFs and heavy metal toxicity as well. So the more heavy metal toxic we are, the more potential there is for this electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome. So again, the detoxification piece that we talked about in step one is also helping us over time to be less reactive to the EMFs that we are not able to mitigate. And they said that heavy metals act as like an antenna, don't they? To Absolutely. pick up additional EMFs. And I do have a whole podcast. Um, I'll include any additional resources and things and things that Scott mentions in the show notes, as always. But um, I think episode 54 could be a good one. We talk about ge geopathic stress, EMFs. And I had a home survey done virtually. So he sent me the kits out in the post. And um, my environment is actually pretty low EMF, which is good. And I do all of those things that you just mentioned. Um, turning off the Bluetooth and trying to not wear the wireless um, ear earbuds as well. That can, yeah, we're, we're both wired up at the moment, which is good. And I also have episode number 72 on mold with Dr. Jill Krista, which is a recent one. But I understand now why you put sleep, optimizing sleep third. Usually I'm like, okay, we need to get your sleep under control. That's where we heal. That's where we regenerate. But am I right that you've put that after the last step, because if you live in a moldy or EMS rich environment, your sleep's gonna be not great anyway. Yeah, so Dr. Klinghart would say that the most common cause of insomnia is exposure to EMF. So getting that out off the table first before we then kind of explore other things that potentially are needed to optimize sleep. I slept beautifully my entire life until about 18 months ago. And so um, this has been an area of focus for me. Fortunately, I'm now at a place where almost every night I can get a crown on my aura ring, which makes me very happy. <laughs> um, but it took some time to Line figure things well. out. And, and I was also um, already reducing the EMFs, and so that didn't seem to be a big player there. But um, looking at, you know, there's lots of supplements that can help melatonin um, for many reasons, but it can also help with sleep, things like um, GABA, 5-HTP, but also looking at potentially blood sugar. So in some cases, if the blood sugar is going too low while we're sleeping, that then can trigger a rise in cortisol to raise the blood sugar. And once the cortisol starts to become elevated, then we're awake. So um, blood sugar is an area to explore. I found a number of tools that have been really helpful. Weighted blankets can be helpful for some people. Something like brain tap um, can be helpful for supporting sleep, but also the parasympathetic nervous system. There's actually a product that comes from the UK called the Z's Sleep Pebble, Z-E-E-Z. 
that you put under your pillow and it creates the frequencies that are required to put the brain into a more restful state that is supportive of sleep. It's been helpful. I won't say that it's been a miracle, but I do, I do continue to use it. And I think that it has kind of helped over time. It does take some time to kind of retrain the brain to a more healthy sleep pattern. Um, again, the aura ring, I think it's a great um, seeing when you're doing a specific intervention, does that increase your deep sleep or your REM sleep? There's also a new tool that I just recently got and am starting to explore. I don't have any strong opinions yet, but it's called the Apollo system or the Apollo neuro band. That's something that you can wear on your wrist or on your ankle. It has a vibration and they also have some sleep programs and meditation programs and energizing programs and things of that nature. Fairly inexpensive compared to a lot of the devices that are out there. So I think that's something um, that I'm uh, still exploring but, but think could be helpful as well in this realm. So every bit of improvement that we get from a sleep perspective will exponentially increase our overall healing potential and all of the other steps that we're doing. I've not heard of a few of those things. I'm going to have to do my own research. Another thing that I found useful is the blue light blocking glasses. Um, so filtering those out. Ideally, we should be limiting our TV and electronic use anyway. But if someone can't do that for whatever reason, then the blue light glasses can be really useful. Um, step four, you mention mental and emotional health. By this, do you mean kind of not what we've been told it's all in your head what do you mean by is it like working on some of the underlying beliefs and traumas yeah so i think there uh, many of us have had some emotional trauma or conflict that set the stage for the illness but i also think that many of us were so invalidated by the medical community by the medical system that we've been told it's in our head that our problem is not real uh, maybe invalidated by our family and that process of going through the illness itself creates a trauma. So whether the, the trauma was before or the result of, I think we then have to explore um, dealing with that trauma on a mental, emotional level in order to maximize our health outcomes. So we all have some emotional issues to work through. Um, accepting that does not mean that the illness is all in our head, but the mental, emotional aspects of it do play a role in the development of physical illnesses. It's kind of interesting that when I started working with Dr. Klinghart, um, I was actually a patient of his from 2006 to 2012. And when I started working with him, um, my way of looking at things was kill the bugs, kill the bugs, kill the bugs, detoxify, and then deal with the mental emotional piece. Um, and that was kind of the priority system that I had then. Now I see exactly the opposite, which really is the mental emotional piece is is top and most critical to explore. Um, and then the detoxification piece, certainly critical from a um, physical perspective. And then the microbial piece lasts. So it's been interesting in kind of following him how my uh, perspective really completely shifted from what it once was. I think in the Lyme community, Many people are type A, overachiever, perfectionists. Um, some, some people um, don't necessarily feel they deserve to be well. So I think we have to look at what are those messages that we're playing? Um, uh, what are we thinking in terms of our deserving wellness? Um, and then cultivating healthy relationships and eliminating toxic people, finding every way to experience joy, which is difficult when you're going through a chronic illness. But we really want to do everything we can to find joy, to not identify with the illness. So it, it is a part of our experience, but it is not who we are. Um, in Dr. Klinghart's five levels of healing model, this is really third level, um, the mental emotional piece. And so shifts that we can make there are very powerful and cascade downward into the first and second level, which is the more physical body and the energy body. Um, so we really get a lot of benefit from doing work here. So some of the tools that could be helpful. 
might include things like EMDR, which is an eye movement uh, system, applied psychoneurobiology, which is Dr. Klinghart's system, um, psychokinesiology, also Dr. Klinghart's system, EFT, or emotional freedom technique, which is a tapping system, emotion code is another one that can be great. And for people that are just wanting to kind of explore this and find some, some tools that will empower them to work on this on their own, Amy Shear. Um, has written a fantastic book. Um, she's actually written several books, but in this realm, How to Heal Yourself When No One Else Can is a fantastic resource that kind of gives you actual exercises that you can go through to help deal with this emotional, mental aspect of illness. Something that does tie into this as well and takes us on to step five is retraining the limbic system. So kind of that reptilian part of the brain, that fight and flight mode. And personally for me, struggling with mast cell activation type symptoms and multiple food sensitivities, when I learned about DNRS, so dynamic retraining neural system, or the opposite Dynamic neural retraining system. Yeah, yeah that one. Um, yep. When I first learned about that, I was like, this is the answer. This is like perfect for what I'm going through. And reading the testimonials, there's like page after page. And I downloaded the course and went through the course. But I find it really difficult to stick with because it requires yeah. dedication and patience and at least an hour, ideally, every single day for about six months. I think I did a week, but I was really struggling with it. And yeah. I'm thinking kind of like, I'm doing well without. Is it worth trying to persevere with? Or is it, do you find it being um, necessary for overcoming some of these problems? Or do you think just getting out in the moldy environment, working on detox could be enough? It's kind of like oh, a selfish question, question for me. Yeah, so I've done DNRS. I did it seven months, an hour a day. So I know the process well. <clears throat> I do think that it's worth it. I do think that of any single intervention that I've seen that come towards what I would call a miracle in terms of people's recovery in terms of their ability to expand their food choices to not be reactive to their environment and so on um, it has been phenomenal um, for people that that stick to it does that mean it works for everybody no um, the timing is also important so you know, Dr. Neil Nathan talks about using DNRS very early on in those people that cannot, you know, cannot even take charcoal or chlorella, they just react to everything. And so he might use it early on to expand the treatment options that he can use in a given patient. Um, however, most of the time, you want to use DNRS to reset or recalibrate or reboot the alarm center in the brain. So if we're looking at the limbic system, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and so on, it is this kind of feeling reactive part of the brain, the alarm center, so to speak. It's really controlling the immune system, our hormones, the autonomic nervous system, which controls so much digestion and blood pressure and heart rate and all of those things. Um, so I think that we often need to do something in this realm. Um, there are a number of tools emerging here. So DNRS is not the only one for people who uh, just do not resonate with it. Um, I do think that we, generally speaking, want to make our tigers no longer tigers, so to speak. So if mold was a tiger and it was a real issue, when we're doing DNRS, we want to have addressed the mold issue. We want to have remediated. We want to have moved. We want to do what we need to do to, to make the tiger no longer a tiger. And then what's happening is now maybe the mold issue, for example, is not significant. It's more like a kitten walking outside the window. But when your limbic system sees it, it reacts as though it's a tiger. And so you're using DNRS to essentially reboot and recalibrate this um, alarm center or perception of what is safe versus not safe. And so there's so many things that can lead to limbic system impairment. This can be mold, I think is a very common one. It can be chemicals or pesticides or microbes or physical, mental, emotional trauma and so on. Um, but I, I think it is the piece of the puzzle that many people will benefit from. Um, there are other tools that uh, brain tap, for example, is one that I mentioned that's a head set that you wear that has uh, sound and light uh, and a visor with light as well. 
um, one of the um, uh, practitioners that I work with uh, will say that DNRS is kind of like driver seat limbic system work and brain tap is more like passenger seat limbic system work. So it doesn't require as much cognitive involvement. You're putting it on, you're kind of listening to a program. I don't think it does exactly the same thing, but I think people do um, oftentimes get a lot of benefit from something like brain tap as well. So um, if DNRS is not the right tool for someone, brain tap, frequency specific microcurrent, there's other tools that are, that are really emerging. Um, but I do think that this is an area that we want to explore and then figuring out also how do we kind of separate from the limbic system, how do we tone the parasympathetic nervous system. So um, what are some tools we can use to calm the nervous system down? I think brain tap is great there. I think some people benefit from certain essential oils that can kind of calm the nervous system. The ionic foot bath that we talked about in the detoxification step, um, that also can be helpful in terms of kind of supporting the parasympathetic nervous system so that it can better detoxify. So really here looking at if we're in that fight, flight, or freeze response, um, we're not going to optimize our healing. We really want to calm the limbic system, calm the nervous system in order to set the foundation for optimal recovery and I am taking inspiration from it and taking aspects and doing things like gratitude and deep breathing and changing my mindset around mold and all of that because at the start I was like very hyper vigilant not to be exposed but I've learned that you can't be completely free of mold and I like your low mold environment not a zero mold environment that's yeah and really just just to add to that, you know, DNRS itself, um, and I took the five-day retreat with Annie Hopper, it is an hour a day minimum, um, but I have heard Dr. Neil Nathan, for example, say, you know, if somebody can't do an hour a day, I ask my patients to do 15 minutes, and they do get benefit even from doing 15 minutes. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily an all or nothing. Might you get more benefit from an hour as compared to 15 minutes? Um, yes, but at the same time, if someone can't do the full hour, maybe they start with 15 minutes until they get to a place that they're then able to do more. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, is, it is still something that could be helpful even with less time, um, though at some point, the, you know, the official position of DNRS is that it should be an hour a day. Yeah, so I'm not going to rule it out completely. I was feeling like I was like forcing myself to do it and it was becoming more of a stress, which obviously isn't good when you're trying to heal. So yeah. I'll, I'll try it again because I know that it's going to be beneficial. I would just find it very difficult. Um, but the reason that I wanted to do it in the first place was for my histamine mast cell related issues. So that's the next point on your kind of 11 step process is stabilizing the mast cells reducing inflammation, modulating the immune response. Um, give us your overview as to how you achieve that with some of your um, patients. Yeah, so I think it's important to remember that getting healthy is not about killing bugs. Um, we do need to address that, but the bug itself is not what makes the disease or makes the symptoms. It's our host response or our immune system response to the bug. So if the immune system is hyperactive, overactive, um, or responding in some autoimmune leaning fashion, um, that's what's creating a lot of our symptoms and creating what we think of as dis-ease. And looking at the inflammation in these conditions, a lot of it is driven by mast cell activation, histamine. Um, a lot of that can be driven by the mold exposure. So really a primary trigger for mast cell activation, um, again, is mold, but it can also be parasites, it can be Lyme disease, it can be environmental toxins or medications or food supplements, even in some people, temperature changes, um, physical, emotional stress. EMFs is becoming a big piece here too. And I think that down the road, we will better understand the impact of EMFs in terms of the uh, mast cell activation. So Dr. Theo, Theo Haridis, um, he has said that just being in the presence of a cell phone will activate the mast cells 10 times, um, which to me was um, a, a, a big revelation that, that the EMFs really do play a big role. So we need to minimize all of these exposures. Um, ideally in the mast cell realm, considering a low histamine diet, I think that is helpful for a lot of people. 
it's not necessarily easy and it's not something that has to be done forever, but it seems to reduce the inflammation enough that people start to feel their symptoms lessening or resolving. And so uh, things that we maybe thought were healthy at one point, like kombucha, or avocados or bone broth or fermented foods may not be the ideal things for somebody that's dealing with mast cell activation and histamine. So um, dialing in the diet piece, often very important. And then looking at mast cell stabilizers and histamine reducers, things like quercetin, luteolin, holy basil, um, there's a few products. Uh, Neuroprotec is one that Dr. Theo Haridas had created that I think is great. Uh, ben Lynch has Probiota Histamine X, which is a combination of probiotics that can help with the histamine issue in the gut. I think that also is a, a fantastic tool. Quicksilver has Hista Aid. Um, and then there's pharmaceutical tools too, like Catodophen, Chromalin, DAO, and, and other mast cell stabilizers or histamine reducers. And treating the mast cell activation really, I think it does lead to a notable shift in how people feel. So at the same time that we're doing mast cell stabilization, histamine related issues, working to remove or minimize the underlying triggers is really critical for longer term improvement. So some of the other tools that maybe are helpful in this realm low dose naltrexone could be a, a, a tool that could be helpful. Low dose immunotherapy from Dr. Ty Vincent. Peptides are emerging here in the immune modulation realm. So the thymocins, for example, homeopathy can be very helpful. And then remembering that getting well is not always about boosting the immune system, that sometimes that can actually make things worse. It's about modulating, it's about calming, and it's about really integrating with our microbes in a more healthy way. I don't know if there's any like science back data out there, but do you have any um, information about like TH1, TH2 balance when it comes to mold and Lyme, like which arm of yeah, the so immune system tends to be most affected? Yeah, so in most cases, Th2 is dominant. Um, so we're more allergic, more autoimmune, more mast cell. Um, Th1 is generally under-functioning, and Th1 is the side of the immune system that's really working on dealing with the pathogens. So we have all of these overreactions because of the Th2 dominance and not enough surveillance or management of the microbes because Th1 is under-functioning. And so we want to work to modulate that as well. Again, that's where the peptides, uh, thymosin alpha-1, thymosin beta-4, things like that are emerging as tools that can be really helpful there. But other things as well, transfer factors, for example, can also be very helpful. So step seven is optimizing nutrition, microbiome, and gut health. I think in the, again, holistic functional medicine world, we're taught start with the gut. This is the most important part. But now we know that if someone has mold in their environment, chronic stress, traumas, then the gut health is not going to improve um, too much. You mentioned a little bit about diet previously, but um, give us your overview on these subjects. Yeah, so so much of the immune system comes from the gut. And if we have leaky gut, we're also triggering more of that immune dysregulation, more mast cell reactions that we just covered. So I think first we need to remove all of the triggering foods. In my opinion, gluten is non-negotiable. It's not healthy for anyone dealing with a chronic illness. So I think that's out. Um, dairy is bad for some people. So I think people will have to explore, but you know, at least trying to avoid cow dairy dairy um, is often very helpful. Sugar, certainly not helpful. Processed sugars, feeding microbes, feeding fungus, candida, Borrelia potentially. Um, the high histamine foods often need to go as well. It really does need to be individualized, um, but the goal is to stop triggering so much inflammation. Salicylates is another area that oftentimes if people are um, really struggling, if they can remove salicylates from the diet, that can be very helpful. There are lots of diets out there. Paleo, autoimmune paleo, ketogenic gaps, SCD, SIBO, low FODMAP, all of these things. Um, I have seen people fairly consistently do well with low histamine combined with, you know, avoiding gluten and often dairy as well. Um, and then what we are consuming should be highly nutrient dense. So healthy fats, healthy proteins, 
I'm a big fan of a power shake every day. So high quality protein, collagen, fiber, phospholipids, healthy fats, chia seeds, those types of things in some organic nut milk. Um, for me, that's been fantastic. And then looking also at um, what are we doing to support the microbiome? So I really like Megaspore Biotic. It's been a great tool here. It seems to be well tolerated even in mast cell activation, even in SIBO. Um, it not only provides these keystone strains to optimize our microbial diversity, but it also can help with the immune modulation side of things, with the inflammation, with kind of calming down the immune system um, and helping with leaky gut. So tools like Megaspore Biotic can be great. Oral BPC-157, which is a peptide, has been emerging over the past couple years, can be really helpful for optimizing the gut as well. Dr. Zach Bush has a great tool. It used to be called Restore. It's now called Ion Gut Health that can also help with um, really optimizing the, the gut and dealing with intestinal hyperpermeability. So lots of tools. Um, but again, I do think that we want to make sure that we're also addressing the mold piece because if we still are dealing with constantly inhaling mold, and the potential colonization, it's going to be difficult for traditional functional medicine GI focused approaches to really work until we've also addressed the mold aspect of it. Step eight is a bit of a com combination of mitochondrial support, hydration, cryptopyroluria, coagula coagulation, and adrenals. Could you tell us a bit more about these? Yeah, so this is an area, again, everything may not apply here, but I think it is worth exploring. So in the past couple of years, looking at the mitochondria has been an area of interest for me. We really need this cellular energy or ATP in order to detox and function and repair. Um, I do like red light therapy in this realm. So something like um, the Juve or the Red Juvenator, there's a number of tools out there can be really helpful for supporting the mitochondria. CoQ10 even. Um, NAD is another tool that's emerging in various forms that I think can be very helpful. We have to be a little careful though in the mitochondrial realm that the cell danger response concept or model, um, ATP is the danger signal in that model. So if we're doing something to create more ATP when we're still in a cell danger response because of mold exposure, for example, um, we then potentially are making that cell danger response even worse. So there's a timing aspect of mitochondrial support and then also introducing things in a way that's slow and low and methodical and not doing things too heavy handedly that's also important. Hydration is a big issue. Everyone that I've talked to with Lyme and mold drinks a lot, pees a lot, still feels dehydrated. And so structuring the water, adding some electrolytes, adding trace minerals, putting a pinch of sea salt, those can all be great. There's other products and waters that are out there that I've been exploring um, that could also be helpful from a hydration realm. Dr. Klinghart has talked about cryptopyroluria for probably 15 years now. Um, he and I have written a couple articles on that. And so if someone has cryptopyroluria, essentially they're peeing out their zinc and B vitamins that are important for the immune system. So you then have an immune system where the white blood cells are not working properly. He calls it an army with no bullets. So supporting the body with zinc and B6 and other cofactors, omega-6 and so on, can be helpful in providing a foundation for the immune system. Again, you have to go slow. You have to start low. We don't want to trigger a release of metals and create more inflammation and more mast cell and all of those other things. So it's always a, a marathon, not a sprint. And I've found over the years that sometimes the more aggressive interventions leave more collateral damage and that a slow and low and gentle approach is often uh, better or, or said differently that sometimes the body responds better to a nudge than a kick in the face. Um, so very important to think about. We don't always need to be too aggressive in what we're doing. Hypercoagulation, another area that's very critical, and um, I, I will be having more information about this up on my site very soon. It's been a key issue for me. I think it's a very common issue for people that are dealing with chronic infections, with metals, with mold, and so on. Um, this is where the blood is, is really thicker. 
than ideal, that there's this hyper viscosity aspect to it um, that can lead to all kinds of problems and also make the overall protocol not nearly as effective. So there are ways to test and treat and monitor, um, usually with different enzymes like lumbrokinase or natokinase or serapeptase. Um, in some cases, pharmaceuticals like heparin and Lovenox may be worth exploring with a doctor as well. And then the adrenals, I mean, we've, we've heard about adrenal fatigue for a long time. Um, um, I think a lot of the times the adrenals are fatigued because a lot of these other stressors that we're dealing with, the toxins, the microbes, all of that. So I, I don't think that supporting the adrenals is necessarily the absolute key to recovery. But I do think that if the, bo if the body has been fighting, um, we can exhaust our adrenals and then supporting it in some way, particularly with herbs, um, adaptogens. Uh, BioRay has a product called Loving Energy that I really like. Holy Basil is another one that can be fantastic here and also support the adrenals, support the mast cell issue is uh, mildly antimicrobial. So Holy Basil, I think, checks a lot of boxes, including in this realm of supporting the adrenals i love that too it's one of my favorite herbs and you can even get that in tea form so even if you don't want to pop another supplement have a nice um cup of tea just to give you some additional benefits and hydration at the same time step nine is what everyone's been waiting for and a lot of people start here so they do a lab test they find the problem they're like great let's kill 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 as you said that is um, probably going to be a mistake and the wrong thing to do for the majority of people. So how do we support the body in overcoming some of these microbial overgrowths? Do you think with Lyme in particular, mold's a little bit different. Do you feel like Lyme or Borrelia um, is something that you can eradicate for good? Or is it just about building your body up so that it's strong enough to keep it at bay? Yeah, so you know we've talked a lot about the fact that killing the bug is not really the road back to health recovery. So that's in part why I put it very intentionally towards the end. I think we have a tendency as humans, particularly as, as largely type A humans that are dealing with these kinds of conditions to really want to be aggressive and really kill things. Um, I think once we start supporting the body against these different pathogens, the order may also change, but maybe a general guideline is to kind of start with looking at the viruses, looking at the endogenous retroviruses that can activate, also again in part because of our growing EMF exposure, um, looking at parasites and gut, uh, SIBO for example, or dysbiosis in the gut, um, looking at fungus and mold and yeast, so the potential for colonization, but also the normal candida and things of that nature. And then Lyme and co-infections I also put towards the end of this microbial step and then potentially looking at the biofilm aspect as well. So once we've dealt with kind of a large portion or the majority of the microbial burden, do we need to do some work in the biofilm realm to um, get at the more protected organisms so that we have a more sustained recovery? So if we look at each of those, um, the viral piece, very common that people have Epstein-Barr virus or HHV6, herpes zoster plays a big role, um, these endogenous retroviruses that we're talking about as well. So once those reactivate um, once we have these viruses and endogenous retroviruses stressing the system, I think we need fairly long-term support. I think these are more persistent than some of the other organisms in that we might need to support the viral piece for you know, a couple of years, but there's a lot of great herbal tools. Uh, BioPure uh, has one called NV or EN-V. Um, Cystus T is another great tool. I mean, I like teas as well. You mentioned holy basil or Tulsi tea. The Cystus T is a tool that can be really helpful in this viral realm, but also in the fungal realm realm, in the Borrelia realm, can be very strong. Again, go slow and low. Uh, Beyond Balance has IMNV2 and 3. There's a bioactive carbon from microbe formulas called Foundation that I really like. So it's helping with detoxification, but also helping the body dealing with some of these viral activations. And then lots of substances like sulforaphane or pantothene, uh, selenium, lysine, and 
also homeopathic tools can play a role in this realm. So um, energetics, for example, has viru cord that can be very helpful in helping the body to, to deal with this viral layer. Then if we look at the parasites and the gut and the SIBO and all of those things, I think, you know, parasites are very common in the U.S. You don't have to leave the U.S. or, or wherever we are to acquire them. Um, testing is notoriously very poor. So I think you have to look from many different lenses, energetic testing, whether it's with Dr. Klinghart's system or electroacupuncture. There is a company called Para Wellness Research, which is Dr. Rafael D'Angelo that I really like. He does um, microscopy looking at stool and urine and finds a very high percentage of samples with some parasites. The uh, GI map is a great tool. The diagnostics GI health panel is another one. So none of these are perfect. Um, I think we have to look at it from several different angles, but there in the parasite realm, there's the concept of larger worms or nematodes or helminths, and then also the protozoa, so things like Giardia or Cryptosporidium. There are a number of herbal and homeopathic tools that I think can be helpful here as well. So Dr. J David Jernigan formulated a product called Paragen that I like a lot. Um, sometimes Layerian homeopathic support here as well, like Paracord from Energetics. Microbe Formulas has other tools beyond balance, BioPure, and so on. There are some people that benefit from pharmaceutical antiparasitics as well. So um, looking at things like Alinea or Ivermectin or Albendazole or Pyrantol or Praziquantol, in some cases working with a doctor um, to explore that potential. And then remembering that when we're killing parasites and killing fungus, we're also releasing more metals into the system. So you don't want to, you know, have stopped step one, which is detox and drainage. You want to keep that running throughout the entire recovery process and ideally probably for life because most of us probably didn't have optimized detoxification to start with. So uh, making sure that we're not losing sight of the fact that when we're killing, we also need to make sure the detox focus is really shored up. And then things things like SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it's not so much just the pathogens per se, it's, an, it's that the microbes are in the wrong place, that they're in the small intestine rather than the large intestine. And while microbial strategies are helpful here, the core issue is more neurological. So looking at things like the migrating motor complex, the autonomic nervous system, the vagus nerve, very important. We can also have other types of dysbiosis, such as uh, Clostridia or Proteus, Klebsiella, H. pylori, and so on. Biocidin is a tool that I really like um, for kind of balancing the microbiome. Megaspore biotic that we talked about earlier also can be very helpful. If we then kind of move into fungus, yeast, mold, all of that. Um, you know, there is this potential for colonization with aspergillus from water damaged buildings. One of the challenges is that, again, when we're, we're dealing with these fungal microbial support tools, we have to make sure that we're thinking about metals being released and detoxification. There's a number of tools Metagenics has a couple of products called Candibactin AR and BR, uh, Beyond Balance, Byron White. They have tools. There are also some practitioners that like to use pharmaceutical antifungals like Nystatin or Itraconazole, um, so that the fungal piece, um, another area that we need to explore. And then ultimately we get to Lyme and co-infections. So looking at Borrelia, at Babesia, at Bartonella, looking at the opportunistic microbes as well that maybe you didn't acquire from the tick bite or insect exposure or whatever the source of the exposure was, but maybe they were in the system, they then become more active. Um, things like mycoplasma, chlamydia, you can also encounter these bacteria in water damaged buildings, mycoplasma and chlamydia, for example. So, you know, we have to think about sometimes our environmental exposure is also where we're getting things like mycoplasma and chlamydia and pneumonia. There are uh, targeted herbal interventions that I think are often a good starting place. So not a really broad spectrum tool that's gonna hit Bartonella and Babesia and Borrelia and potentially blow somebody out of the water, but that are gonna be a little more gentle and a little more targeted. So Beyond Balance, Byron White formulas, they, they have tools that are a little more specific, like 
bar one or a BART, for example, or a BAB or BAB two, for example. So I think kind of unlayering things in a methodical fashion um, before starting with something that's a broader spectrum antimicrobial tool is a good strategy. Um, and then once we have that kind of layered approach implemented, then later I think we can move on to broader spectrum tools, um, to the biofilm support and so on. I do think that um, the biofilm piece should come fairly late in the process process that we can release more microbes, release more toxins into the system, that we can trigger um, inflammation, mast cell activation, and so on. So the biofilm piece is something we want to be very um, intentional about in working with a practitioner. Uh, the BioPure Cystis T, Dr. Klinghart talks about that as a selective biofilm tool. So it's not, not all biofilm is bad. Um, some of it's actually very good and healthy and important for us. And so the Cystis T is one that can help more with these pathogenic biofilms. And then there's a lot of different enzyme products that can be helpful here as well. Again, really important to work with a practitioner on them. They, they can definitely stir things up for people. Um, in general, while I personally did three and a half years of antibiotics in 2005, we didn't have a lot of these tools that we have now. If I were kind of starting over, I would certainly go the natural route first. I'm open to some pharmaceuticals that are, you know, shorter duration. I do think that uh, people in some cases will benefit from pharmaceuticals that maybe didn't benefit from natural options. But we also have to think about long-term use of antibiotics potentially creating an environment for more fungal overgrowth, potentially causing problems with the mitochondria. So it's not um, the first place that I think of. And then coming back to your question about do we get rid of these things or do we just manage them? I think for the most part, with Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia, I think we I think we do manage them over our lifetime. I don't think that we eradicate every single organism, but I don't think that that is a message um, of concern. I think that we are already more microbe than human cell. And I think lots of people carry these organisms and don't develop any health challenges from them. Some uh, people like Dr. Zach Bush actually say that they may do some beneficial things for us. So approaching recovery as if it's a battle or a war or we have to kill or eradicate, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the way that we want to approach it. Now that said, um, disulfiram is emerging in the Lyme community over the last year or so as a pharmaceutical tool that was originally used 60 plus years ago for alcoholism. And there has been a lot of excitement around its use in Borrelia and even in Babesia um, for being very helpful, including people that have been on it for a period of time and then uh, even after having relapsed every time they stopped pharmaceutical antibiotics were able to do disulfiram and then get off of it and not have a return of symptoms after a long period of time. So there is some thought that that maybe it is um, eradicating potentially Borrelia. It's still something that's being explored and still very early in terms of its use in the Lyme disease realm. But I, I generally am drawn to more herbal tools, so things from BioPure or Dr. Bill Rawls with Vital Plan or Supreme Nutrition, um, Beyond Balance and Byron White formulas I mentioned, DesBio, uh, MAPA Herbals, Research Nutritionals, Nutramedics. I mean, there's so many of these companies out there now that have some really fantastic tools that I think the natural approach is often a very uh, solid place to start. Agreed. And some people may be surprised to see on this on this 11-step uh, process, dental contributors. So um, why is that so important to consider? And why do you put it so late in the process? Why does that not come near the top? Yeah, so some of my mentors like Dr. Klinghardt and Dr. Simon, you would generally explore the dental piece very, very early. Um, though more recently, Dr. Klinghardt has suggested that you at least want to address the retroviral activation, the endogenous retroviral activation before getting into the dental work. 
in some cases, it makes the dental work not necessary. In some cases, it makes the recovery um, easier. In, in cases, it makes the likelihood of um, complications from a dental procedure less. And so dealing with some of that retroviral piece um, may make sense uh, before diving into the whole dental piece. I think for some people, there's going to be really obvious, you know, something happened that is dental related that kind of triggered their illness, or there's just some really significant issues that are known that they might need to move this step earlier. But for the most part, um, I, I usually kind of like to do the things we can before something that maybe is a little more invasive. So amalgams, root canals, cavitations, all can be major stressors on the system. I personally had cavitations that were identified by Dr. Simon Yu. I had them surgically addressed seven years ago. Um, I'm glad that I did it. Um, they likely were there for many, many years. I mean, I had my wisdom teeth removed when I was in high school. And so there was probably some low grade infection that was brewing there that might have actually weakened my system and set the stage for Lyme disease and you know all of the things that came with it. Um, but generally speaking, I think the, the dental piece we can explain Explore once we kind of get some other things in place, detox, fix the environment, all of that, change our diet, improve our nutrition, and so on. Amalgams certainly contribute to mercury and every other heavy metals in the system. Um, I think it's important to not only have a biological dentist doing the removal, but also timing these dental procedures. So um, having some uh, collaboration between the dentist and the doctor that's managing the broader care, making sure that it's the right time, that it's not going to kind of um, get the, the direction of the protocol moving in a different direction. Root canals, those can obviously have major implications in the body, impacting organs and associated meridians and so on. Um, all root canals are infections. Um, some people have asked um, or commented or observed that, you know, root canal is the only scenario where we leave a dead body part in the body and, and expect it to not cause a problem. So again, I don't think that means that everybody should run out and get their root canals removed, but I think it is a conversation to have with the doctor, with the dentist, and see, you know, is that potentially something that's suspected as a contributor to someone's current health situation? Cavitations are areas of the jawbone, often from prior tooth extractions. Um, they can occur elsewhere. It doesn't always have to be related to an extraction. And then those with Lyme disease and co-infections can also be at higher risk for dental cavitations. And some of the co-infections, like Bartonella, for example, can play a role in these um, cavitations. So that generally would require some surgical intervention to go in and, and clean them out. I don't feel like we're at a place yet where um, ozone injections or light therapies or things like that can actually address a significant cavitation. And Dr. Klinghardt, his observation has been that most of his chronic Lyme patients do have some cavitations that ultimately need to be addressed. The tonsils can play a role. So um, particularly in people that have had like recurring strep or in kids with pandas, for example, um, sometimes doing things with the tonsils, whether that's uh, cryotherapy in Germany, for example, was one of the things that I did a couple of times. And so the more significant dental issues really do need some biological dentist or oral surgeon and so on, but also looking at what can we do from a self-care perspective to minimize the microbial burden systemically that's originating from the mouth. So Supreme Nutrition has an essential oil product called Oral Defense that I like, uh, biobotanical research, which makes the biocidin that we talked about in the gut um, conversation. They have one called Dental Sidon that's very good. Essential oils, oil pulling. I think there should be some focus on how do we minimize the um, the microbial overgrowth and, and optimize the microbiome of the oral um, cavity as well. And so my thought process in putting this towards the end is not that it um, shouldn't in some cases be earlier, but also that it shouldn't be taken lightly. And it's also very important to really have that established relationship between the biological dentist and someone that is guiding your overall care so that you can figure out when the right time is to explore these things. Last but not least, step 11, which is regeneration and restoration. What exactly do you mean by this? 
Yeah, so I think after we've gone through years, potentially, some people don't get diagnosed for many, many years, that the, the, the illness itself has taken a toll on our body, um, that we need then to look at ways to repair, to regenerate, to restore. Um, and some of these can be introduced earlier as well. I mean, it's not that we can't do anything here, but at some point looking at things like how do we repair the cells? So using phospholipids, for example, um, some people will explore IV therapies like the PK or Patricia Kane protocol. I also use phosphatidylcholine in my morning power shake every day. Um, peptides are emerging here really as a tool to help repair and restore and regenerate the body. So things like BPC-157 and many, many others. And I think that's, a, that's an area that's just really opening up and that we're going to see so many other good things coming out in this peptide arena. Using tools like photobiomodulation or red light therapy to support our mitochondria, to rebuild our collagen, to give us more photons, more vital force. I think that that um, uh, tools like Juve and Red Juvenator, and there's many of them on the market now, can be um, very easy ways to really support the body systemically. Um, and then stem cells and exosomes and all of those areas, I mean, they're continuing to evolve as well. I personally have not found stem cells to be a game changer in Lyme disease or mold. I think it's expensive. I think a lot of people think that if they, you know, spend a lot of money on it, that it's going to make a big difference. And for the most part, I haven't seen that be the case. Um, I'm, I'm continuing to, you know, watch and monitor and see, you know, exosomes is kind of another evolution of stem cells and maybe there will be a time for those and and particularly in restoration and repair and regeneration um, I've not seen them be helpful particularly when they're done too early in an overall recovery maybe later in a process and then I also use um, tools like Vasper which is a cold compression exercise device um, that can really help to increase growth hormone and testosterone and support the thyroid and things like that so looking at what are the tools once we're feeling good again that we can really use to repair regenerate and restore you don't want to do all of that work and then get bit by another tick or move into a moldy house and then go back to where you were. So we want to Absolutely. keep the ball rolling, maybe not as many supplements or as many therapies are needed, but long term, we just want to be taking care of our bodies in the best way that we can. Wow. Yeah, that was... it, you know, since, <laughs> yeah, I mean, since you say that, I do feel like you know, the process of going through an illness is really a messenger that many of us maybe weren't prioritizing ourselves. And, um, you know, the fact that we then need to stop and say the body's kind of um, gone into a chronic illness to say, hey, you know, you're forgetting about me. I need to be a priority here too. So we learn as we go through the illness how to prioritize ourselves. And I think it is important to your point that we continue to prioritize ourselves. And if we don't continue to prioritize ourselves in the decisions we make, in the environment, and the foods, and our detoxification focus, all of those things, I think we've maybe missed the message of the illness. Yeah, these things really are lessons in life and as hard as they can be, and especially for um, maybe younger people like myself who have dealt with things in their teenage years, early adulthood, and they missed out on a lot of different things. Yes, it is uh, really hard when you're going through it, but at least for myself, I can say that long term, I know how to take care of my body and that will mean a reduction of like chronic disease risk in the future. So I, I find the silver lining and I hope other people, um, it's hard to tell people when they're in it, but looking back, like hindsight is quite important. Yeah. And, you know, to your point there too, I mean, you have so many good points. I, I think we resonate on a lot of this conversation. Um, you know, Dr. Klinghart has said that those of us that had the early awareness of, okay, you have Lyme disease, you have mold illness and had to... Um, change things to prioritize ourselves and really focus on our health that we probably long term will do better from a perspective of other neurological conditions like Alzheimer's like MS like Parkinson's and so on so I think 
in some ways, people maybe have some of these things smoldering for many years and they don't even realize that there's a problem and thus they don't do anything about it until years later they have a much more significant challenge. So I'm um, anticipating that the focus that I've in the, the, the investment that I've put into my health will have very long term rewards. Yeah, it absolutely will be. And I know for myself and you as well, we were on this path for a reason and think of how many people what you're helping, both of us are helping from what we went through. Before we finish up, I've got three very quick, quick fire questions. I know we've been talking for a while. I could literally talk to you all day. The first one is, is there a book or a resource that you'd recommend either on mold or Lyme or chronic illness that the listeners could benefit from? Yeah, I mean, the, probably one of the more recent books that I've read in the mold realm was um, Dr. Jill Krista's book, who I know is recently on your podcast, so Break the Mold. Um, that is a fantastic tool, and I definitely would recommend it. I mean, there's a lot of great books and things out there now, but um, Dr. Jill Krista would be the one that comes to mind. Yeah, and I love her naturopathic approach as well, because some practitioners are very um, focused on the pharmaceuticals which is fine like in some cases but I love her approach with herbs and food as medicine and maybe I'll throw one other in because yeah. it's also critical and that is toxic by Dr. Yeah, Neil yeah. Nathan That's like and that Bible. really <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean if I had had that book 20 years ago things life would have been so much easier and so that one really gets into mold but it also gets into um, Lyme and Bartonella and mast cell activation and limbic system I mean it, it is tremendous and so toxic by Dr. Neil mm -hmm. love that one too what's one herb nutrient or supplement that you couldn't live without Oh, well, there's probably a lot more than one. Um, <laughs> I, know, I knew this was going to be a tricky one for you. <laughs> I would say... Um... I would say the binders are really important for maximizing detoxification long term. So I tend to rotate them. So I can't necessarily pick one, but tools like um, microbe formulas, bioactive carbons, or Takasumi Supreme, or something in that realm, I think those are are really critical. Um, There's something that I always have in my protocol, but I may rotate binders from time to time just to get uh, different materials that have different binding affinities. But I would say that the binders are really critical in what I do daily. Yeah, and we're bombarded by environmental pollution. As soon as we step out of our house, even if we're in an EMF and mold-free environment, as soon as we step outside the front door, we, we still need this um, ongoing support. So I agree with that one. Do you have one final piece of takeaway advice? So to sum everything up into one or two sentences, what would you say? fix the environment around you so that your internal environment will also become healthier as you continue working through your recovery process. Don't miss the potential that the external environment is the thing that's weighing you down. And if only I knew this seven years ago, <laughs> that would have saved me a lot of time and money. So Scott, you have been so generous with your time. I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are and you are saving lives whether you know it or not literally and figuratively um your podcast so i want you to tell people where they can find you and everything but your podcast has been an amazing resource for me over the past couple of years in educating myself and having my eyes open to all of these different opportunities and therapies so um yeah i want to thank you so much i know that everyone listening is going to want to find more from you so could you tell us where they can find you online you bet. Yeah, so uh, betterhealthguy.com. All of the podcasts are there. You can find them also on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and so on. Um, so betterhealthguy.com is where you can find me. I, I would also mention Limelight Foundation, which is an organization that I've been on the board of for the last seven years. And it is an organization that is intended to provide treatment grants to children and young adults 25 and under that are dealing with Lyme disease. Disease. And so at this point, we've now given out over $5 million to grant recipients in 49 states in the United States. And if someone is listening, um, I know not everybody listening to this show is in the US, but if someone's listening from the US and is in need of that kind of support or in a position to support the organization, uh, limelightfoundation.org is where you can learn more information. And I would just say, um, 
don't lose hope. Don't ever give up. There is so much that's changed in the Lyme disease and mold illness arena in terms of our understanding of these conditions in the last few years. There's new tools, new solutions that are constantly emerging. And so just keep in mind that there is hope. People do get better. And, and that's what I would leave you with. Amazing. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you.